Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about how to fight the devil. That's right. We're going to give you tips and strategies from the saints and from doctors of the church on how to fight temptation and resist the urges of the devil. Clearly, we got to turn to Jesus. And what did he say? Satan, get behind me. Definitely a, a topic I think a lot of people are curious about. We, we've we uh, kind of talked before the show. There's a lot that we could present here, mm-hmm. um, but I think we've picked some pretty good topics here. That's right. And, you know, every day people struggle with temptations. They struggle with, um, you know, either purity, with uh, living uh, to the fullest calling of their Christian um, nature. Um, we are beset all around us with the temptations and the snares of the devil. And these, what we're going to share today are some really practical ways that you can make it so that you're more able to fight the devil and the temptations that he puts on you. Now, we really enjoy starting our shows recently with a Bible quote. And I think beyond the Bible quote today, I think it would be wonderful if all of us would just take a moment and pray the St. Michael prayer as we start this this episode together. So this scripture verse comes from the letter of St. James, chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And together, let's pray the St. Michael prayer as we begin this time together. St. Michael, the archangel, defend Defend us in in battle. battle. Be our protection protection against against the wickedness and snares snares of the devil. devil. May God God rebuke him, we humbly pray. pray. And And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the the power of God, God, cast into hell Satan and and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. souls. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So clearly, I mean, right off the bat, it's all about turning to God. And even when we pray that St. Michael prayer, it's by the power of God. So, you know, turning to God, as the letter of St. James expresses, we resist the devil and he will flee to you. So our refuge is in the name of the Lord. Our refuge is in the name of God. But on this show, we have very practical ways for you to turn to God emphatically with a specific uh, form of prayer and activities that will clearly give you that refuge. Yeah, you just read from the book of James, and James has a lot of really great insight into spiritual warfare, which is really essentially what we're talking about today. Um, And in, in 1 James 14 to 15, I think he really sums up the nature of the battle. And uh, this is James 1, 14, 15. One is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. The practicalities of that and and just the logic behind Uh it, uh, it it gives us a sense of... being very discerning of how we do concede our will and how sin is, is truly, we're drawn into it by this roadway that, that he gives us a road map to. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, you said concede the will. Mm-hmm. And that is such a, a great statement on this because it really is conceding the will. You are allowing your will to be either ruled by your appetites or ruled by temptation. And I think a great way, and the first thing that I think we should talk about in breaking that is one of the great tools of all of Christian history in fighting the devil is fasting, Mm -hmm. which is breaking the appetitive nature of your own self. Because again, when you're giving into your little bit of desire, that gives birth uh, to sin, and that sin gives birth to death. And the easiest way to cut that off is by, you know, having that temperance. You know, that's really a virtue that we need to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, definitely, you know, the the idea of pruning, you know, a a vine, Mm -hmm. you know, I think fasting is, is gives God the opportunity to break through and just allow you to see, um, some of your sinfulness and, and, and experience the delight of not being attached to them, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And it's not always fasting from food. I think a lot of time people immediately think fasting, well, that means I'm not eating, you know, but there's, there's fasting from a lot of different, um, I would say, uh, 
physical it, it, impulses. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and it's, it's really rooted in the senses. So your your senses can absolutely feed your appetite. You you know what your indulgences are. Mm-hmm. I mean, whether you're listening to a particular music that's that's really unbecoming of spiritual advancement or, or love, um, maybe it's cultivating anger, maybe it's cultivating lust, um, you know, or what you view, you know, and what you're seeing, what you're speaking. You know the differences, and we do concede our will, and when we do, it, we're we're literally conceding it to something that we know, objectively speaking, is is wrong. Mm-hmm. So St. Alphonsus Liguori is just one of my favorite spiritual writers. Yeah. If you haven't checked him out in the past, he also is just like a great warrior in the spirit and gives phenomenal insights to the spiritual life. He commented on, on uh, fasting in this way. He that gratifies the taste will readily indulge the other senses. For having lost the spirit of recollection, he will easily commit faults. I want to have a strong backbone. I want to grow in self-mastery. I do not want to be a slave to my passions. I want to embrace the attitude of St. John Chrysostom, who said, fasting is wonderful because it tramples our sins like a dirty weed while it cultivates and raises truth like a flower. Real quick thing, a really interesting thing about St. Alphonsus the Gory, his spiritual director is a kinsman of yours. He comes from the outside of, you know, in the countryside, Thomas it, Pagano. His last name was Pagano. I do, re, I do remember that. There's a church just outside of, uh, of St. Mary Major where the image of Our Lady of Perpetual Help is and St. Alphonsus Liguori. And it's one of my favorite places that many people don't go to visit, but one of the most powerful places in, in the churches in Rome to go to go pray. Yeah, interesting. So that is that is a cool little connection. Yeah, it is. Now, I, I think, you know, look, look in the Bible. Look at how Jesus prepared for his ministry. He went out into the desert and fasted. Mm-hmm. Uh, look at um, John the Baptist. He fasted. <clears throat> look at the early, the instinct of the earliest Christians who really became the great spiritual doctors and kind of really, I think, helped to shape the direction of the spiritual life of the church as reality on earth Mm -hmm. is they all went to the desert and they fasted. So you're looking at like Pacomius, Anthony of the Desert, Athanasius, right? You're looking at all these desert fathers and their instinct, their spiritual instinct, because they didn't have the benefit that we do of 2,000 years of spiritual teachers. They didn't have that. They are in the first generations and they're instinctual thing is go to the desert and remove all these temptations for our lives. They, they were led by the spirit. Yeah. That's what Jesus was. I think that's also very important too, because um, with fasting, you can get a little uh, nuanced in it. I think if you pray and, and ask for signs on how God would want you to fast, because you, you really do it in the spirit, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's fasting can be, I mean, you see all this stuff online and everything where it's like, you know, 30 day fast and then, you know, you get renewed and all this stuff and it's like a shake or something that you drink. But when you give things up, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people that give up, you know, their worst thing. And I'm like, you're miserable, you know, <laughs> like God, God's not calling you to like, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. incrementally rooting out sinful things and, and it's a practice. It's not a destination, mm-hmm. right? It's a practice. So I think for uh, fasting, a lot of things, uh, being uh, conscious of the spirit, like what is the spirit calling me to do? Mm-hmm. You know, th- speaking of the desert and the fruits of fasting that that you're describing, and the spirit in which we fast as well. It's like you mm-hmm. know, wash your face. You yeah. know, don't yeah. don't walk around gloomy. Yeah. You know, all day. At least use the grease wipes. <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, Della Cross, thank you for using the gl- grease wipes. Ding, you're looking ding, clean, clean, clean. So. Like you're saying, you know, the birth of the church from Pentecost and the movement of the initial, like St. Anthony of Egypt and the mothers and fathers of the desert that went out, what was their primary objective? To come to identify how the human person is enticed to sin. And one of my favorite recent reads, actually, so I want to encourage everybody out there, Evagrius was one of these fathers of the desert. And he was the one in the fourth century who established the eight evil thoughts. So the battleground, my brothers and sisters, is in the mind. St. Paul expresses, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Well, we've got to discipline our flesh, and we've got to recognize how we're being enticed. So Mm -hmm. the eight evil thoughts of Evagrius that he identified with this primary objective, gluttony, lust, avarice, anger, sloth, 
sadness, vainglory, and pride. Now, what does that what does that sound like? Those the all became deadly sins. those became the deadly sins. They became yeah. the deadly sins oh. in and the I Latin think, church. I, I think sloth and sadness kind of got combined into mm-hmm. one into like acedia. Mm-hmm. But there's the wisdom there, being able to identify these are the these are kind of the easy traps that people fall into. And one of the things about fasting, whether it's fasting from food, which you should absolutely do, mm-hmm. you should have those actual practical physical fasts, in addition to the fasting from media from speech, however. But when you're fasting from something, what does it make you do? It makes you hungry. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is remove, you know, the spiritual junk food that satisfies you only for a few seconds. And you're trying to use this fasting to create an actual hunger and a hunger for God, like we hear in the uh, Beatitudes. You want to be hungry for God, and that's Mm -hmm. what fasting does. So when you're hungering... And you're removing, I guess, you know, just the little snacks that you're having throughout the day that are not really satisfying you. Now you have a hunger, and the only thing that will satisfy that hunger, that proper hunger, is a relationship with God. Now, speaking of fasting, we're going to make you fast right now from this incredible content so that you could push the subscribe button and click the bell on your YouTube channel right now. They should click it very fast. They should click it fast because we got to get right back into this content. And make sure you're giving us a thumbs up, sharing our content out there in the World Wide Web, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're everywhere on all the podcast forums as well. Spread the fruits of the show because we all do need to enter into a greater discipline in our practice of Catholic faith. And fasting is most definitely one of the premier ways to resist the devil because we are resisting our senses. And that is where that enticement comes in, where we do concede the will on a a primary level. I mean, Satan's called the Rex Mundi, the Lord of this world, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the appetites of this world are the things that satisfy the citizenship of this world. And that's not Mm -hmm. what we're after. Mm -hmm. This world is not our home. Yeah. The other, the other thing too, and I learned through, um, Opus Dei when I was in DC is that you can make small sacrifices during the day too, as well. You know, you can, you know, see something or be a part of something and, and fast from it during the day. And they taught, taught me how to make sacrifices throughout the day, Mm -hmm. you know, of things that you might want to say mm-hmm. where you're like, oh, I'm not going to say it, mm-hmm. you know, like different things, especially related to, you know, what your sins are in confession, yeah. you know? So, you know, if, if just talking about speaking, so if your, your know, sinfulness is idle talk or it's, you know, whatever, gossip it's like or, gossip mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, wanting to say something, being conscious of it, making a sacrifice to God and saying, God, I, I offer this to you for the sanctity of my own soul in the world. And what I love yeah. about that is intentionality. Like you're, you're yeah. taking this moment and like your intention before God is that I'm going to resist this for the sake of you, mm-hmm. for the sake of you, God. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, that I idea. do it all the time with seven mm-hmm. kids, man. I'm like, I'm <laughs> there's all like, sorts of things you want to say. <laughs> well, I, I usually don't do it when I'm on the phone with Sheil because he's, he's always laughing because I'm yelling at my kids. But, uh, oh, I'm a dad too. I got kids too. So I, I, I yeah. get it. We, we commiserate over yeah. the, the loudness <laughs> that children bring. Yeah. You know, um, with fasting, um, there's two really simple fasts that I encourage everyone to do. I know that it's not technically a requirement, but start trying to do the Friday fast from meats. It's really simple. There's a lot of great options. Even if you're still eating something that's not really in the nature of fasting, just try to give up meat on every Friday. There's a reason that the church for all of its history and its wisdom and her wisdom was a proponent of that. Mm -hmm. And the other is really try to do that fast before receiving Holy Communion, at least an hour, but really like, you know, on Sunday morning, you know, from Saturday night when you go to bed until you receive on Sunday morning, don't eat. Don't, you know, don't have a nice breakfast before and then go out. It's important because it's creating a real spiritual hunger for yeah. the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I love, love that. eating after mass. Like, hey, that's, that's, that's nothing better. Yeah. And your yeah. kids love it too. Nothing better. Mm-hmm. Kids going to food after yeah. mass is like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great tradition. Yeah, I, I do. I do think that that's such an important point that you've made in respect to hungering for the things that satisfy and when we do hunger and we orient our appetite toward God and we realize that God wants to fill us in all of our senses, you know, you think of the incense, you think of the Holy Eucharist, you think of the proclaimed word of God, you think of viewing the sanctuary and the elevation of the sacred species of God's bo- Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. Like he, w- he wants us to be immersed in the beauty of that 
and be fed in every respect mm -hmm. and that I would be next to my neighbor and I could have contact with my neighbor and love my neighbor. Don't hold my hand, you know? hand during mass though. I'm just asking that personally. You know that I had an awesome experience. I think I've shared this with you before. Let's squeeze, squeeze it at the end. So, when so, we're done, squeeze it at the end. Oh, oh, get over I, want to, I want to hold Howard's hand. So I was in the Holy House of Loretto. Father Tetlow had to come back to uh, Santa Maria del Mar. Somebody had passed away, so he needed to do a funeral. So this this priest who spoke English, but he, uh, Italian guy, but he spoke English, he was covering the mass. And I was serving all of the masses. This, I was just like a youth minister at the time. I was just getting into it like a year in. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we all held hands at the altar for the Our Father. That's all I knew. Even at St. Elizabeth, you know, growing <laughs> up, like everybody held hands during the Our Father. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm dressed in my album behind the <laughs> altar and he starts the Our Father and he's got his hands out like this. So I'm like, do I do? Do I? Is this an know, invitation? Is this an <laughs> so I just start edging closer and closer to him, closer and closer to him, and and then I just kind of reach out and I, I just grab his hand and reach no. out, reach out, and he goes. And when he does that, he goes. <laughs> he, just smacked, he just smacked my hand, and I just like ran back to the corner. <laughs> and then afterwards, I said, "Father, I'm so sorry." I said, "You know, at, my, at, at church, we all hold hands at the Our Father." Um, I apologize, <laughs> and I said, can I have your blessing? And I, I knelt down. He was just a super old Italian priest, and he, he blessed me in Latin, and he cocked back and slammed me on top of my head, like smacked me hard. <laughs> Bam! And I was just filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it, was just so, yeah, awesome. it was an incredible, incredible experience. Um, uh, real, one last thing on fasting, and we'll talk more about this later, but one of the best programs for men to learn about fasting is Exodus 90, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that, but that really does give a great structure and a great introduction to some of the pract ascetic practices, um, both about modern media and then the very traditional ones of the Desert Father. So we'll talk about Culturally that speaking, I mean, they've set something powerful into yeah. motion, Exodus 90, and, and it really does structure a support group for you to be able to approach these ascetical practices too fast and, and receive the benefits it's a, from it's it. It's a great intro into fasting too, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of guys that I've met, um, that tried Exodus 90, it was their first time doing that, you yeah. know, like going through a fast and you need support from your brothers. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things with them is that, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, a couple pillars of Exodus 90. There's, you know, fasting, there's um, prayer, there's fraternity. There's some really important things. But the fasting aspect of it is really super helpful um, and gives you that structure. So one of the things that they're doing, you know, over the summer, you know, you know they'll do like the 90-day fast leading up to... Uh, leading up to Easter, they'll do fast for Advent. I'm sorry, Exodus is Exodi? Exodi. Exodi for Lent. Um, but summer, look, abstain from unnecessary, unnecessary screen time. No meat on Fridays. Fast until 4 o'clock. Cold every, showers. Each weekday, cold showers. 20 minutes of prayer every day. No unnecessary purchases. Don't watch unnecessary you know, media, you know, you might not want to watch the boys, right? It's, you know, pretty graphic, right? It's probably not good for you, even if it's culturally entertaining. So Exodus 90 helps you to create a system that allows you to really bring these into your life. One thing that that you mentioned before, Delacrosse, and, and what you're mentioning with Exodus 90, and it is absolutely a very important aspect of resisting the devil, and that is prayer with the heart and being intentional in prayer. And Exodus 90 provides that intentional prayer on a daily basis that gives you a regular routine with that support that you're praying with others, and that is, that's how we resist with our communion with one another and our prayer intention intentionality from the heart. Yeah, that's right. So look, if any of you guys out there want to try Exodus 90, go to exodus90.com forward slash the Catholic talk show. You can download the app and get started. 99% um, of men who've tried Exodus 90 um, reported that they have less attachment to the things that are inhibiting their spiritual life. They said that they were saving on average $100 a month by not making unnecessary uh, purchases, that they've been increasing their prayer time by, you know, multiples. Um, they're experiencing greater joy and a better closeness to your family. So go to exodus90.com forward slash the Catholic talk show, download the app and get started today. Now, I think a good segue from, you know, the fasting, right? So now we've expunged things from us. Now, how do we bring things back into us? And I think that spiritual reading is a great way to kind of, um, 
I guess, supplement those spiritual caloric intake that we've now reduced ourselves from. Mm -hmm. Um, Spiritual reading is true intellectual nourishment in the fight against the devil. Mm -hmm. And and the the most sublime reading that you could do spiritually starts with scripture. Mm -hmm. Reading the Bible with devotion is very, very important. Um, Outside of the Bible, looking at some of the mystics, you know, that like St. Alphonsus of Liguori, like a St. Ignatius of Loyola, um, you know, looking to the saints and their witness, you know, certainly gives you spiritual strength and forbearance to follow their example in Christ and and draw strength. Yeah. Um, Spiritual reading, I mean, look, there's so many options out there now to get, you know, books that are easily accessible. You can get them through Audible. You can get them through the Gutenberg Project for free. You can get all the old, you know, uh, books. You can get them on a Kindle. You can go to the store and buy them. There is... I mean, the catechism's online. I mean, you don't even have to, you know, buy it. It's it's online. Yeah, I mean, there is access, so there's really no good excuse not to be doing spiritual reading. And like you said, you know, with with Scripture, having a little bit of a a regimen to it. Now, I'm loath to recommend your... Your, your nemesis as being the premier media priest in all the world. But Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, that's a great thing. You know, it's a little podcast every day my wife to get you into scripture. To it's, yeah. You know, he's, a lot doing, of, a lot he's of my, doing great work with that. Yeah, you know? a lot yeah. of my parishioners listen to him as well. And it's good because it opens people up to scriptural contact. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, it's very accessible. Right. It's not, you know, an hour and a half every day of mm-hmm. intense you know, whatever it's broken mm-hmm. down into very small pieces, mm-hmm. which I is, think, which is what we're talking about here. Yeah. And you I, know? I, you know, it's, it's evident for me in my spiritual life that when I set aside 30 minutes solid of scriptural reading, it, it has an effect spiritually. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were even indulgences attached to reading scripture for 30 minutes, you know, so there's, there's a sense of, you know, the church expressing, hey, there is an effect that is positive to the soul as it relates to to hmm. meditating and praying with Scripture. Yeah, I mean, and there's things like study Bibles that you could just read one verse and then get all kinds of context mm-hmm. and really open yourself up to a lot of, you know, thinking and a lot of meditation mm-hmm. on Scripture. And like you said, there's great spiritual masters like Alphonsus Liguori and, and, and Athanasius. And we did a whole episode on books that the saints read. Mm-hmm. So go check out that episode. The Soul of the Apostolate. That's right. There's mm-hmm. so many books out there, but doing that spiritual reading, right? You've gotten rid of things in your life with fasting. Now let's start bringing in some more beneficial things, right? You stopped eating, you know, cheeseburgers, beers, and sausages. Now let's start bringing in, you know, something mm-hmm. spiritually nourishing. Um, and that would be, you know, spiritual reading. Mm-hmm. Now, I Something think, I always say with scripture is is scripture informs prayer. So I want to make sure that we're emphasizing prayer as as a way, intentional prayer from the heart, as a way to resist the devil. And we do need scripture to inform our prayer. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a great way to kind of boldly underline. So we have fasting, mm-hmm. we have spiritual reading, scripture, and that scripture should inform your prayer. And then how how do we pray? Uh, and, and some of the things that we can do, well, the rosary is a perfect way to pray to resist the devil. Mm-hmm. And meditating on the life of Christ within the rosary is, is really, there are fruits attached to each mystery mm-hmm. from all four mysteries, you know, and, and <clears throat> praying from the heart, praying the rosary, Chaplet of Divine Mercy, uh, the St. Michael uh, Chaplet, and there's the so Jesus many other prayer, The Jesus is Prayer personal. is another one. I mean, that's a great one for meditation yeah. and just kind of getting that silence. But yeah, that's that's the third way to fight the devil on our list is, look, prayer. Mm-hmm. And, and Ryan, you said it earlier that prayer is just essential to all of this. None of this is possible without prayer. And, you know... Starting to starting to fast. Fasting is a prayer of the body. Spiritual reading is a prayer of the mind. But it all goes back to prayer, that communion, seeking mm-hmm. communion with the Blessed Trinity in, in trying to um, better ourselves and fight the devil. Look, when if you've ever been having a conversation and someone else is trying to talk to you, if you're really focused on another person, you're not hearing what they're saying. And if you're communing with God through prayer, you're not having... You know, you're not involved in that conversation that Satan's trying to use to tempt you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people practically 
uh, struggle with prayer, right? They uh, <clears throat> either can't get into like a regimen like me. You know, my mm -hmm. my big struggle later on in life was that I, I, I had to make time for it. Like, you know, because it, it just wasn't showing itself. You know, you get to be a young adult and then you're married with kids. It's a different spirituality. Um, so I think a lot of people uh, suffer practically with that. Um, <clears throat> and the, the catechism of the Catholic church mentions that and, and how, you know, we have this great possession and communion with God that, you know, this is the lifeblood of our faith, right? Mm -hmm. And so you you have to set aside time and not be discouraged in prayer. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, a, a great tool for prayer, and we've talked about it for, you know, going on more than a year now, is hollow. Again, kind of using some more modern technology to, like you said, find a way to make sure that prayer is part mm -hmm. of your everyday life. Uh, you know, Their hollow. library is unbelievable. What they have available for everybody, uh, you know, is just it, it showcases the history and the legacy and the heritage yeah. of Christian spirituality and richness, the yeah. richness of it. I mean, they've got everything on there yeah. and it I, continues to grow. I mean, they have over 5,000 different audio guided prayers, right? 5,000 different prayers. I mean, I have my little prayer book I take with me to mass. It's like this big. It's probably got 200 prayers. Hollow, it would be like... It's a whole ten, library of prayers. I do 10 minutes a day on the, the Lexio Divina, and mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, it's it's great. And it's easy. We it's all, so easy. We all got a phone in our pocket. Yeah. Let's I, use I'll that for something I'll put it on the, good. you know, even on the days where I forget. Mm -hmm. If I'm driving in the car more than 20 minutes, I just turn it on, and I just pray that way, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I take what I can get. I can hang out with God for a little while, do it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and they got a lot of great resources out there. They got prayers led by Bishop Barron and Father Mike Schmitz, Jonathan Rumi, Mark, Mark Wahlberg, Marky Mark, Sister Miriam. A lot of great prayers, a lot of great traditions. They have novenas. They have all kinds of different things. They have Bible stories. They have our buddy Matt Frad's lo-fi just to kind of get that, you know, they have chant. They have everything. So if you go to hollow.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show, you can download the app for free. It's something that we really wholeheartedly recommend yeah. because – it's a great app for, like you said, finding a way to start a practical prayer life. Yeah. And, and what it comes down to is we need to participate in these cultural movements. It calls each of us to set into motion these responses of what our present ills are in mm -hmm. society so that people can actually find freedom. You know, the things that dull our senses and, 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 you know, root us so actively and habitually in our sins, there are things out there that break us out of that. And these are some of those, uh, those opportunities with Exodus 90 and Hallow. And what are we fighting? It's, it's what St. Thomas Aquinas expresses, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's just so perfectly related to, to what we're talking about. And the Council of Trent affirmed it as the implacable enemies of the soul. So if we don't communally respond to the enemies of the soul, we're, we're at a disadvantage. And, you know, these two uh, things, but there's so many other resources in the Catholic Church online, like you were saying that the Vatican website that has every type of encyclical, every type of reading, mm -hmm. every type of, Jeez. you know, my goodness, the catechism, everything's there. Your tools are there. But it's, it's really, uh, you know, <clears throat> finding them, using them and putting them into practice. That's right. Um, speaking of taking things and putting them into practice, I think the fourth one on our list that we, we identified, and there's a lot of ways to fight the devil, but these are, you know, a lot of the things that we were talking about just before are maybe armor, mm -hmm. right? They're things that are protecting you. Now let's start talking about some things that we're going on the, uh, we're going on the offensive. And one of those things that is almost like a weapon in spiritual warfare is sacramentals, mm -hmm. holy water, blessed salts, mm -hmm. blessed candles. Mm -hmm. These are Saint real. St. Benedict medals. St. Benedict mm -hmm. medals, absolutely. The crucifix, mm -hmm. you know, the Miraculous primary of all medal. Of them. Mm -hmm. These things are not, they're not talismans. They're not, you know, good luck charms. They are imbued Idols. with a spiritual character by our devotion to what they represent, right? Mm -hmm. And they are, they do have a real spiritual effect. I mean, even blessing yourself with holy water is a miniature exorcism because it can remove venial sin, right? Mm -hmm. Just blessing yourself with holy water with the intention of atonement can remove venial sin from your, you know, from you personally. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. I was guiding people through the liturgy of the hours at my parish where we're starting to pray morning and evening prayer. And for the Magnificat and the Canticle of Zechariah, 
we always start, you know, my soul proclaims mm-hmm. the greatness of the Lord. And, you know, I was expressing to them that when you begin the Canticle of Mary or the Canticle of Zechariah, you make the sign of the cross. So I started the first line and we kept on saying it over and over again about 10 times, just making the sign of the cross, because I said, you know, I want this to become a fabric of your of your devotion and your and your daily habits of prayer in the Liturgy of the Hours. And at the end of blessing ourselves 10 times, I said, how do you feel right now? And they're all like, I feel great. I feel great. And it's it's true. Did it's you just a... Miyagi then? <laughs> <laughs> my no, son. It's my job. My son. Yeah. It's my job. Now show me sign of the cross. Like, <laughs> what? I just, uh, wait, devil's trying to hit me with a cross punch? I'm just <laughs> blocking him left and right, man. That's, that's Wex some, on. Wex on. That's some Catholic Miyagi business, man. Hey, Good man. job. Um, you know, we, we've, we've done episodes on holy water. We've done episodes on candles. Uh, bless salt. These things really do have a spiritual impact against the demons and against the chief of the demon, Satan. Um, yeah, I really love having holy water in the house. I know we all have it. Blessed candles, you know, really that the purity of that light, the light itself becomes a sacrament, not just the, the wax and the wick, mm-hmm. but the photons coming mm-hmm. out of this candle are sacramentals. That's mind blowing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, holy salt, you know, using it as a perimeter around your house. And that's, that's a great physical, um, tool to fight the devil, uh, having blessings done to your house by a priest, all these things make a real difference. And in doing them, you are actively participating in the fight and you're aware of it. You know, it's kind of a, you know, they are imbued with the spiritual character, but by the act of using them, you're also, um, increasing their efficacy. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, for Easter, uh, for you know, we do a gift. Like typically, it's a book for the parish, Christmas and Easter. Um, this year for Easter, you know, the whole sense of baptism was just so rooted in my mind. Like we need to give every single family a holy water bottle because not every family is having. It. And to and to really instruct people how to use that holy water and take the authority that you have dominion over your home and over your property. Yeah. You have a dominion. And, and you want to consecrate that to God, and you have the authority to do that. Even at the, at the epiphany blessing, like you have the authority to do that. It's great yeah. when a priest can come over yeah. or a deacon sure. to, to bless your home, but to, <clears throat> to know that you have the authority to go around your house and sprinkle holy water and call on the blessing of Almighty God in your, in your own domain. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's demonstrable, right? Like, I mean, we had a guy in here that researched exorcisms, mm-hmm. Things like that. Um, Father Kevin McEwen, I mean, he's had experiences with holy water and people that have infestations of evil or whatever you want to call it, spiritual infestations. Like, this is real, but you could also do it as an affront, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think that's what we're talking Mm -hmm. about here is that you can actually take these steps in, in faith and it, and it can be an affront to anything that's trying to, Mm -hmm. you know, interrupt your life. And and if you are doing that, and if you are going, you're mobilized and you're going out for this more of like an affront, mm-hmm. it's very important. And this is a, another aspect of what we're talking about today. And we have to emphasize it, sacramental life and going to confession on a monthly basis and receiving the Eucharist regularly um, in the state of grace is that ability in your communion with Christ and your repentance from sin to go out and take more of an affront act- actionable mm-hmm. steps to bless and and take dominion of your home. <clears throat> yeah, there is nothing more powerful and this is the one that you know I wanted to close with. There's nothing more powerful in the spiritual fight in the fight against Satan than the sacraments. That is what Christ left us cuz he knew that we were going Amen. to need that. You know, and they are they're physical and spiritual in nature, but the sacraments. I, I I've heard exorcists say on multiple occasions, the it is more powerful to have confession in the Eucharist than to go through the rite of exorcism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Think about that. There is more spiritual warfare going on in what most people think of as a typical mundane act of you know going up and receiving communion and going to confession, than in the big dramatic you know yeah. pee spitting, vomiting, heads twirling around, yeah. windows breaking exorcism. Yeah, the, the and glory, we take that for granted. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the glory of God exists like and persists through humility. Prayer is an act of humility. It is. I I want to. 
I want you because I can't do it with me. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're Mm -hmm. literally making that. And, and when we go to mass and we go to confession, that is also tied directly to our own humility to say, you know, Lord, I need your mercy so that I can see clearly, you know, I can, I need to take out the trash, you know, I need to uh, receive Holy communion and humility. It's, it's an act of humility that, that Christ would even come to us and die for our sins. That humility is called upon on exorcism prayers from the laity in Father Rippinger's book. It's like the humility of Christ, the humility of Mary is sends evil flying away. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about blessing your house, when we talk about fasting, the spirit of humility that you're allowing God to work in your life and however he does it, so be it, you know, just like Mary says to, you know, the angel, that's where the power of God lives, Mm -hmm. right? That's where the trajectory of, of God and his kingdom can make further advancements into evil. That's and, awesome. And and related to that, we had a show uh, with Don Calloway mm-hmm. on, on Saint Joseph, and we talked yeah. about Joseph as the terror of demons. Yeah. And and what what it's exactly yeah. what you're saying. He's the terror of demons based on his humility. Hum, ultimate humility. Yeah. You the know, devil I, hates that. Oh, yeah. what, what was the fall of the demons? Pride. Mm-hmm. It was pride. And what's the antidote to pride? Is humility. 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 But but there's an antidote to it. But it's also it literally is the power power and the glory of God that's hidden amongst us in this world that we live in with all this sin and distraction, the the glory of God is within this like very humble place mm-hmm. that lives and, and persists in people's hearts. Let's face it, when we're struggling with something that's untenable or just unbearable, it's when we're suffering it by ourselves. Where we're consoled is when someone's with us in the, mm-hmm. in the suffering, then they're bound to us. There's, you know, God sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, and he has bound himself in a covenant of his blood so that we would not face this world in virtue of our baptism as children of God. We would not face the world, the flesh and the demons and the devil alone, alone. And, and we need each other and we need to humble ourselves and realize that we have an interdependency. We, we have the opportunity to participate in things like Exodus 90, Hallow, or another movement that you out there can start. You know, we need to be the ones who respond as a community to the ills of society that is polarizing people and isolating people at great numbers where people do feel alone. And you may be feeling alone out there right now, too. And and I'm just glad that you have found us and you've found a family to be a part of and, and a community to be a part of, even online. But how more important is it that you find a church and a community geographically Graphically close to you, so that you can form relationships with others in Christ and and battle, you That's know, right. and enter the battle. You know, in the Saint Michael prayer, you know, Satan prowls about for the ruin of men, and that word prowl is always very, it's very graphic to mm-hmm. me. And what you know, it gives me the sense of a wolf, a, mm-hmm. some of a, a dark beast. And what? Do the, how do those animals hunt? Mm. They go for a pack and then they cut off the weak ones yep. and divide them from the pack mm-hmm. so that they can be devoured. Because a wolf cannot take a whole pack of animals. It only can take the weak. And what makes you weak is these, you know, spiritual maladies of, and not fasting. So all these things that we can The weak you, and the young. That's right. The weak and the young. Great point. The vulnerable. Yeah. And that's right. You're either vulnerable through weakness or through mm-hmm. your own youth and inexperience, mm-hmm. which, you know... How many times have we seen, even in our own lives, being young is that's a wide open synonymous with that. (laughs) It really is in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. The problem with youth is that it's wasted on the young. (laughs) But but it also calls us to the responsibility. I mean, look at the world that we have our kids being raised up in right now. And it's Uh, like if if we don't take a step and try to create an environment, you know, we were talking just yesterday about how accessible, you know, pot is and and gummies are. uh, you know, how how accessible drugs are, you know, in comparison to when we were coming up. It's like the, it's it's much more. You used work. to have to earn your weed. Yeah, you know? it's like and, and like even even like the, um, you know, from the sexual revolution to where we are right now, 
It's like, you know, you can express yourself in all these different sexual forms. And it's like the world is presenting all of these things that are just dividing, categorizing, isolating, polarizing, and separating us. Confusing. And confusing everybody. And it's like dull your senses, you know, like feed your flesh, feed your appetites. This is this is the this is the ultimate experience of ecstasy in life, you know. Do your hallucinogens, have these sexual occasions and escapades that that are gonna give you the the ultimate euphoria and it's like no we're made for so much more than the world the flesh and the devil mm, that's and great. and that's what we're getting at and entering into this battle does cause us to be self master you know to have self mastery to discipline ourselves and none of us are perfect like we all fall short of it because we're in the flesh yeah but it, we know the path and and we've got to be there for each other and be accountable to one another so that we can move in the right direction you know that that's a really great point that you bring up about all these different compartments that society puts us in you are this type of sexuality you're into this type of you know high you're into this type of whatever and they always say hey you're part of a community now. You're now part of the LGBTQIA plus community. You're now part of the, like the gummy community or the edibles community. You're now part of a gamer community. And they always pitch it as you're part of a community. But what does it really do? It's really isolating people into one aspect of their life and making them focus on that at the detriment of the fullness of life. Because life is about way more than just sex or a particular high or even one particular interest. You're not part of a community. You're isolating yourself around one thing, which is still going to leave you ultimately hungry at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know? and, and we want our voice to be heard. Well, if it's all of these polarized communities that everybody's wanting their voice to be heard, what do we have? Ultimate yeah. confusion. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing being heard. It's like a it's like a great big tower of Babel in the model, modern sense that now instead of speaking hundreds of different languages to cast us apart, now we just have thousands of different interests that we have to coalesce around mm -hmm. and we can't actually be one people. Mm -hmm. There's no of that, that sense of Catholicos. There's no universality. We don't want universality. We want you to be in the one little pocket so we can keep selling you the same stuff over and over again and stay right there because it's easy to target you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's easy to separate you from the pack. You are now one little group cut off from the larger whole body of Christ. And, and the sacraments and in the community of the church, of the parish life, is, again, the antidote to that. And mm -hmm. that's... I don't know of a better way to, you know, stab the devil in the eye with a sharp stick, right? <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. That's what we're trying to do here. So, you know, to summarize once again, you know, we started with fasting. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about prayer from the heart, talked about scripture, spiritual reading, you know, the sacramental life of the church, very important and using sacramentals, mm -hmm. you know, these, are, and there are many and community. others. I think we added the and, six And then like, community. yeah, that, that, the community elements of what all of that represents is, is really the ultimate call. Jesus wants us to be one. Ut unum sent is all about that, mm -hmm. you know, that Jesus is calling us to be one and we are one in him. And when through faith and through Jesus Christ and the power of the spirit that we can enter into a oneness with one another. And that's what we enjoy here on the show, being at one together and, and really seeing this community grow. Um, so thank you to our patrons that support this movement. You know, thank you to our sponsors, Exodus 90 and Hallow. We love partnering with them. And as we continue this countercultural movement, you know, let's celebrate in gratitude what God has given us. God has given us one another that we would not face this world alone. So we get to be there for each other presently. And then beyond that, like the fact that God communes with us in the sacramental church and, and the proclaimed word is being sustained in, her, in the practice of the church, what a gift. And we're nourished by the bread of life in the Holy Eucharist. So we want to wish each of you a beautiful, beautiful week. As you start out the week, we thank you for connecting with us at the Catholic Talk Show, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm.